I want to preach for a little bit, and then we're going to come back together here in a little while here with some worship and activation. And, you know, there's some messages, in my opinion, and I bet in a lot of yours as well, that we ought to be talking about all the time, regularly. Very important messages. The message that Jesus Christ has came to save us, is that something we should just talk about maybe every 10 years? No, we should be talking about that all the time. And, you know, last week I talked about how Jesus Christ is the healer. Do you think that we should be talking about how he's come with power to heal us? What, every seven years maybe? Or we should be talking about that all the time, that Jesus Christ is the healer, right? And, you know, there's another one, and I want to talk about that today. And I think it's one we need to be talking about all the time. It just needs to be a regular part of our mantra. And that's that Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, Jesus Christ is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That's pretty quiet. That is pretty quiet. Now, I can honestly tell you this. I can honestly tell you that other than my salvation uh, encounter with the Lord, me being filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Holy Spirit, I can honestly tell you, other than being saved, being filled with the Holy Spirit has been the most significant life-transforming thing that has ever happened. And it wasn't just a long, you know, a one-term event, a one-time event. But God wants to continually be filling us with his presence and his power. Amen? You know, prior to that, you know, I was like a lot of you growing up in church and the whole deal. And, you know, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was a little kid. But the whole time I just, you know, it felt like I was, you know, I had a car and I had to just push it everywhere I wanted to go. Gee, if I want to go here, push the car there. You want to go there, you push the car over there. But, you know, when I was 16 years old and I dedicated my life to the Lord full on and he filled me with the Holy Spirit, it was as if God finally said, here's the keys. And he gave me the keys to the car so that I could finally tap in to all of the horsepower that was under that hood. How many of you know you were not intended to live life by your own strength? Amen? You know, when you said yes to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came into you. Did you know that? Did you guys know that? How many of you have said yes to Christ? Raise them up. Then the Holy Spirit came into you. But did you know that in addition, he wants to have all of you? The Holy Spirit wants to fully captivate your life. Amen? Filled and overflowing. Now, the devil wants you to think this. He wants you to believe that, boy, if you just kind of give the Holy Spirit more access into your life, that that's going to turn you into a weirdo. Or maybe the devil, devil would tell you, you're fine just where you are. It's not really necessary. And you just kind of keep pushing the car everywhere. And you're being robbed from the amazing benefit that we have. See, the Holy Spirit, he's wonderful. He's kind. He's personal. He's powerful. And how many of you have experienced that friendship with his spirit is life-altering. Raise your hand if you know that to be true. Friendship with the Holy Spirit is life-altering. And, you know, that's really what I want to talk with you about today. So often, we get so busy kind of laying out the biblical framework for it that sometimes we forget that really what it boils down to is an intimacy of friendship, an ability to go deeper, an ability to say, God, have more of my life, and I want more of what you have for me, that we would walk in friendship, that we would be enthralled with his personhood and his power and his kindness. You know, there's so many benefits that come with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. One, we've talked about this one many times. It's in Acts. This is one of the benefits. He says what? You will receive power. Let me hear you say power. power. You will receive power power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Listen, your, your Christian life doesn't have to be a constant struggle of you trying to make it work. But God finally gives us the power of the Spirit. 
And you know what? This isn't some junior varsity power. This isn't some third string power. This is the exact same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection power of God wants to fully permeate and overflow and ooze out of your life. Amen? Let's give the Lord an applause for that. Hey, how many of you have a hard time loving some difficult people? Who would be honest and say, I am the difficult person? <laughs> I'm the hard one to love right here. <laughs> yeah, you may have a hard time loving difficult people. I know I do. Did you know that the Holy Spirit in you will help you learn to love like Jesus loves? He will give you the ability to do. He'll produce in you what you could never produce in yourself. How about the fruit of the Spirit? Look at this one, everyone. It didn't say the fruit of your own effort. It didn't say the fruit of your own strength and your own ability. Look what the fruit of the who? The Spirit will produce in your life. It'll produce, would you say them with me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, gentleness. And did I say gentleness twice? Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Listen. The Holy Spirit produces that. Your main job in all of this is you just keep going deep with him. As you abide in him, he produces extraordinary results in your life. The Holy Spirit produces that. And you know, when you're living and walking in the Holy Spirit, there's a treasure chest of spiritual gifts to begin to tap into, to open and put those... Uh, into practice to unwrap. Now, how many of you know it'd be a sad thing to miss out on spiritual gifts, right? But it would be downright tragic to miss out on the friendship that we can have with the Holy Spirit. That'd be downright tragic. You know, sometimes people have a hard time deciphering what the will of God is. Do you know how you find out what, what the will of God is? Then get to be really close friends with God, the Holy Spirit. Because now you have God who knows everything. God who is all-knowing, who is dwelling inside of you. He's dwelling inside of you, amen? He's all-knowing. When you have this awesome friendship with the indwelled presence of the Holy Spirit, did you know that is something only New Testament Christians can enjoy? Let me say that again. The indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit is something only New Testament Christians Christians know anything about. You look in the Old Testament and there were times when the Holy Spirit would descend and come upon somebody for a particular task. You read about it with Samson and many others, but you know the Holy Spirit would come on Samson and he pushed the pillars and the roof of that temple came down. You guys remember the story? And then what would happen is the Holy Spirit would come off of them. It wasn't until the death burial burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that made it possible for you to become the residing place, for you to become the temple of his spirit. You are the place now where God's spirit dwells. You are the temple of God. And quite frankly, I think it would blow Old Testament um, patriarchs away to discover that there are New Testament Christians that simply kind of turn their nose up at this incredible privilege that we've been given. Think about that for a moment. He wants to fill you with the Spirit so that you can do all that God's called you to do, so that you can be the father and the mother and the person you long to be. That's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know you cannot do it on your own? I can't do it on my own. The guys who work with me, they know, yeah, he can't do it on his own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need the power of the Holy Spirit to transform my life. You know, when you were saved, let me put it this way. When you were saved, earlier Sherry used the word baptized into salvation. I like that. When you were baptized into salvation, you became a new person. When you were water baptized, you were making a decision to cut off 
the old person. But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, now you're receiving the power necessary to live out what it means to be that new person. Does that make sense? When you were saved, he made you a new creation. When you were water baptized, you made a decision to cut off the old life. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, now you have the power to live out the new life and say no to that old person. Amen? How many of you know that's a big struggle? Say no to that old guy. He reels his head. And when you've got the power of the Holy Spirit, finally you've got something, a, a power beyond you to live out what God has called you to do. You know, the Bible says that he's your comforter, that he's here to walk with you through the challenges of life. It says that he's your teacher, that he'll teach you what you need to know. I like what it says in John. It says, when the spirit of truth comes, what? He will? He'll guide you into all truth. He'll guide you into all truth. He's here to help you. You guys ever, you're not quite sure how to pray? There's a lot of times I don't know how to pray. Look what the Bible says here. It says, we don't even know, <laughs> we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray. Would you say it with me? But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed with words. I can't think of kind of a better uh, biblical putting it out there of what your prayer language is all about being baptized with the Holy Spirit and having the prayer language where we can utter these things to God. Utter these things to God. I've talked about many of the benefits that he's just our comforter, that he's our teacher, that he helps us to pray when we, when we don't know how to pray, that he baptizes us with power. These are all wonderful, wonderful benefits, but the greatest benefit of all is that we get to go deeper in friendship with him. How many of you know that's an important thing? How many of you love your mate? That's not a trick question, okay? Do you love them? And because you love them, you want to go deeper in friendship and knowing who they are. And that's what God has made available is the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit that enables us to know and catch God's heart more and to operate in what he has for us. So let's go ahead and follow my outline. And Jesus Christ fills the believer with the Holy Spirit. Would you say that with me? Jesus Christ fills the believer with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's just like Jana was saying. When you said yes to Christ, he came into you. But at some point, you have to activate what's in you. Does that make sense? And so Jesus wants to fill you. Yeah, the Holy Spirit comes in when you said yes to Christ, but look at my next point right here. And that's that he wants every believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me hear you say every believer. Every believer to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a believer, raise your hand. Raise them up high. Okay, you know what that means? He wants you filled with the Holy Spirit. Why don't you turn to the person next and say, he wants you filled with the Holy Spirit. So it kind of happened like this. Jesus rises from the dead. He walks the earth for 40 days as a resurrected Lord. That's pretty powerful stuff right there. And just before he ascends to heaven, he's with his disciples. And he tells them, he says, I'm going to go to the Father, but in a few days... You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, don't you leave Jerusalem. Don't you go anywhere, but wait. Because when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive power. And you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here they are. They're held up in the upper room. Man, their knees are knocking. They're scared to death. Because remember... A few weeks earlier, they drugged Jesus off and crucified him, right? And these disciples, they're thinking, hey, we better stay in here behind locked doors. They're struggling to understand scripture. They're struggling to put their faith into practice. They are struggling just to hold up to the fact that they feel like they've just been abandoned 
by the one that they called Lord. But Jesus told him, don't fret. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send my Holy Spirit. And the big day comes in Acts chapter 2. I mean, this is incredible. I'm looking forward to watch the movie here, the replay when I get to heaven. Because there's the sound of the blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then they saw what looked like tongues of fire that came and separated and came to rest on each of them. Let me hear you say each of them. And these fireballs, just boom, they're sitting over their heads right there. And then look what it says in verse 4. All. Can I, let me hear you say all. All of them. All of them were what? Filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Each of them, all of them, were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Can I just tell you that this event completely transformed these disciples who were struggling to understand Scripture, struggling to activate their faith, struggling to even go outside those locked doors. When all of a sudden they were filled, it completely changed, man. Peter comes out, preaches a message to those that were there crucifying and giving approval to his crucifixion just weeks earlier. And all of a sudden, 3,000 of them get saved. And these guys go around setting the world ablaze. Amen? The Holy Spirit transforms. He changed me. And he came to change you too. Amen? And it's not meant to be a one-shot deal. I told you when I was 16, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so have I lived the rest of my life since then under that one moment? Absolutely not. Look what it says. Let's go to the next verse. It says the disciples were continually filled. Let me hear you say continually filled. Now listen, if the disciples were continually filled, do you think God wants us to be continually filled? Amen. He absolutely does. Now, I want you to imagine this. Here's this 120 people. They're in this upper room. The Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they began speaking in, in tongues. They're all speaking in tongues, all of them, right? Now, do you hear of any interpretation taking place in that upper room? Think about this for a moment, because I'm gonna, I, what I'm doing is I'm speaking into some of the myths and some of the confusion people have had on this. So this is very important that you hear what I'm talking about right now. When they were filled, all of them, and they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit, they're all up there speaking in tongues. Are you hearing interpretations taking place? They were not taking place. And you hear some people, they'll quickly shut down the speaking of tongues, saying, well, if they're speaking in tongues, there should be an interpretation. The Bible says that. And to answer that, that's partially true. But when they say that, what they're doing is they're revealing their lack of understanding of what the Bible actually says about tongues in the church. See, when you begin to read the Bible, you discover that there's two expressions of tongues. One is the gift, and one is for your own personal use. Now, the gift of tongues, Paul talked about that in Acts chapter I mean, pardon me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where he begins to list the spiritual gifts. You guys remember that? And there's nine of them that he lists. And what was one of them that he listed? He said, speaking in tongues. And then the next one was what? Interpretation of tongues. And what did he say about those nine gifts? What is their purpose? What's the purpose of them? To, to edify the church, for the common good, for the building up of the church. So we must understand that when, the, when it's a tongue that's meant for the whole body, yes, not everybody's going to do that. And yes, there should be interpretation so that the body can actually benefit from it and be edified. But we have to understand that there's a whole nother aspect of this that's available to all of us. And that's what Paul was talking about when he said this verse. In verse 14, 1 Corinthians 14, 18, 
when he said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Would you say that with me? I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Here's a question for you. Would he say all of you if it wasn't actually possible for all of us to speak in tongues? It wouldn't make any sense. That verse would not make any sense whatsoever. And then he goes on to say, when Peter steps out and preaches that morning, out there on that promenade, he says this. He said, this promise is for you. Let me hear you say that, everybody. For you. This promise is for you. It's for your children. And it's for all those who are far off. Who was he talking about when he said this baptism that we've experienced what we've just encountered here this is for you it's for your children it's for all those who are far off help me out church who were those who were far off okay distant lands distant distant times distant places this promise is for you we are now those who were far off this is for us amen Let's give the Lord an applause, shall we? I hear people say some of the most stupid things. They say, well, tongues are of the devil. That's pretty, pretty self-reliance, bold stupidity to say something like that when the Bible talks all about it. Which, by the way, can I just tell you when you start reading the book of Acts, they weren't just filled in the whole, with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. You start reading all through the books. Gentiles, Jews, church leaders, common people, they're all being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. And people say, well, tongues are of the devil. That makes no sense. If tongues were of the devil, how come uh, drug dealers aren't speaking in tongues? Think about that one for a moment. How come the guy carjacking you isn't speaking in tongues? He's doing devilish things, shouldn't, and if they're of the devil, shouldn't people doing devilish things be speaking in tongues? If it's of the devil, that's a lie from the pit of hell to try to rob you from an incredible benefit that God has for you. I've heard people say, well, that's fine, but it's not for me. But how do you argue with the fact that the Bible says it's for you and your children and all those who are far off? That's, that's silliness. For us to say, well, that's good that he gave that to the church, but it's not for me. See, we have to understand, yes, there's a public use. Not everybody does that. The Bible says that clearly. People like to take that verse and say, see, not everybody speaks in tongues. He's right when it comes to the public exhortation. But in other places you read when it's for my own personal use, my own building up, my own walking in friendship with him encountering with that comforter, the power, the fruit of the spirit, all of those benefits that we talked about. That's what he's talking about when he says all of them. And I wished all of you were speaking in this as much as I was. It's important for us to understand that. Uh, God's the giver of good gifts. I love that verse. I didn't put it up here. But he says, you know, you, even though you're wicked, when your child asks for a loaf of bread, are you going to give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, are you going to give him a snake? And if you, although you are wicked, you know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? You don't have to fear that when you say, God, fill me with your spirit, that you're going to get something evil. God is the giver of good gifts. Amen? Let's give him applause for that. I want to talk with you briefly about why I believe every believer should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why every one of us should. Now, I talked about these benefits just a little bit ago, that he's our comforter that he's our teacher, that he helps us when we don't know how to pray. He helps us tap into the dunamis power of God, the resurrection power that takes blocked passageways and blows the way clear for you. Those are good benefits. But let me talk with you about just a few others. 
Here's one reason why I think every believer should desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we all need spiritual edification. Let me hear you say that. We all need spiritual what? Edification. edification. Give me another word for that that maybe we would understand better. We all need to be spiritually built up. Okay? We, need, we all need to walk in the power. Okay? Now, how many of you have got a cell phone out there? Okay, pretty much everybody. I've noticed you've gotten much better at silencing them at church. You guys learned, man, when the phone goes off, the pastor answers them. I can't even get off the stage anymore. You guys are so fast. You learned. But uh, how many times uh, did you buy your phone one time and then that was it? No charge? Never? How often do you have to charge your phone? Help me out, guys. How often do you have to charge your phone? you got to charge it every day. And I want you to understand that the infilling of the Holy Spirit and our prayer language is an opportunity to plug right into God. i got to tell you, man, when I'm driving in here on a Sunday morning or where I'm driving to work or wherever I am, it's like, God, I need my soul built up. I'm weary. I'm tired. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? My flesh is weak. And I have to pause, and I pray in the Holy Spirit. And I'm driving down the road, and I got one eye open, and my soul's just plugging right into capital G-O-D, and my spirit's getting charged up for whatever I need. I'm being edified for whatever I need for that day. Amen? Now, you can probably tell when I'm falling off a little bit, I probably needed to do that a little bit more. Amen? I said this earlier, but I want to talk about it a little more. One of these benefits, why every believer should want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because he helps me pray when I don't know how to pray. It says we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself, would you say that with me? The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Last night, I got home, and my wife just kind of shared, you know, my daughter, she's kind of struggling right now. She's going through a tough time. I didn't know how to pray for her, but the Holy Spirit did. And so I just sat at my kitchen table, and I began to just pray in the Holy Spirit. I began to intercede in the Holy Spirit. And I knew that God, the Holy Spirit, was already on the situation. I was going through Facebook, and I discovered a friend. I, I haven't spent any time with him in several years. You know, you've had friends during different seasons of your life, right? So this was a friend from a few years ago. Now, we don't hate each other. We're just not in contact with one another. And as I'm going through Facebook, I realized that he had experienced an accident, and he, he passed away yesterday. And immediately, I like, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray for his wife. I don't know how to pray for their kids. But the Holy Spirit did. And I began to pray in the Holy Spirit. There's times I pray for my wife. I pray for my son. I pray for my daughter. There's times I don't know how to pray for this church. Renda, I don't always know how to pray for you in the battle that you're in right now. But I know the Holy Spirit does. And I take some time and I begin to intercede and let the God who is all-knowing utter through me God-directed prayers that line up with his perfect will. Some of you say, well, I've prayed in a prayer language before, and I didn't even know what I was praying. That's okay. The Bible says when I pray in the Spirit, that my spirit is edified. That's why he said, Paul said, I pray both ways. I pray in my native language, then my mind is profitable, but then there's other times I pray in the Spirit, and then my spirit is profitable. I pray in both of those, amen? Do we understand what he's talking about there? And then the last thing I want to say is this about that. 
is that because praying in the Holy Spirit will stimulate your faith. Let me hear you say that. Stimulate faith. When you go to lay your hands on a sick person, how many of you need a special dose of some faith right there? Okay. When you're dealing with some challenges, anybody need a special dose of faith? Look what the Bible says about that. This is in Jude. He says, build yourself up in the most holy faith and what? Pray in the Holy Spirit. When I pray, when I'm stepping out in these areas where it's like, man, this is so far beyond me. I take some time. I pray in the spirit because it helps ignite my faith. It ignites, it cultivates faith. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. It cultivates your faith. And in Mark, it says this, these signs will accompany those that believe. Would you say it with me? These signs will accompany those who believe. They will speak in new tongues. So how do you do it? How do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, the first thing is you have to believe it's actually for you. When, uh, when Peter said this promise is for you, it's for your children, it's for those that were, are far off, and you see the examples in Scripture, at some point you have to come to the place in your own heart and believe, yes, this is something God wants for me. Amen? Because when there's not belief there, it's going to be very difficult to step into it. Secondly, is you want to give your fear to God. God is the giver of good gifts. You don't have to worry that you're going to get some weird thing, that getting filled with the Holy Spirit is going to turn you into some kind of freak. What it's going to do is help you become more the you God intended you to be all along. Amen? That's what the Holy Spirit does for you. So you give him your fear, and then you expect it. Jesus said, ask. Would you say it with me? Ask, and you shall receive. Ask, and you shall receive. I remember being a kid, and I'd be at the camps, I'd be at the things, and I would see these guys, and their faces were red, and they're, you know, they're just screaming at the top of their lungs and in tongues, and I would see that, and it scared me. I thought, I don't know what they're doing. And then they would say, you need this. And I thought, if you say so. <laughs> and I would come up, and they would all be, you know, there'd be five of them in my face just spitting and screaming at the top of their lungs in tongues, and I'm just waiting for something to happen. And it didn't happen. Does anybody have an experience like that besides me? And it didn't happen other than I walked away going, that was weird, and then God must not like me. And as I began to grow, I began to understand more this activation that Jana was talking about, this partnership that takes place. Because God is a gentleman. He'll fill you with the Holy Spirit. But for you to tap into the ability to exercise this prayer language that helps you walk in this deeper connection, this deeper intimacy, to tap into all those benefits, that really requires your partnership. So it really wasn't until years later, until I was 16 years old at that camp, that I began to realize that for me to ever speak in tongues, I need to believe he's already filled me. I asked, I received, so therefore it's now up to me to step out and begin to open my mouth and begin to put some sounds out there and let the Holy Spirit begin to form that into my prayer language, and he did it. Now, I'll tell you what happened. That was on a Friday night. A Monday, I went to school, and the devil was already telling me, you made that up. Anybody can speak a bunch of gibberish. You made that up. But the proof was in the pudding when all of a sudden I walked with a boldness and a fire down the hallway of my school. And I remembered what he said. You will receive power to be my witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I'm going to ask if we could stand together and listen. This isn't about speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues. I hope we've come to the resolution that it's available for all of us. Public use, no. Should be an interpretation. Private use, yes. 
available for all. Amen? But really what it's about is saying, God, I want all you have for me. I want everything you have. In fact, it's, it's more desperate than I want. I need everything you have for me. Jack, where you're at in your life, can you do it on your own? You don't just want, you need. I need. You need. We need the abundance and the power of the Holy Spirit. 